Welcome back, Falcha. This is part four of Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon by Dave McGowan. And let us continue. Chapter eight, All the Young Turks, Hollywood Tripping. Hollywood's Young Turks, and I guess this is a nickname given to young male movie stars, uh, were an immediate and constant presence on the Sunset Strip scene. Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Bruce Dern, Dennis Hopper, Warren Beatty, also included Jane Fonda, Nancy Sinatra, Sharon Tate, Jane Mansfield, and Jane Mansfield had very close ties to Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, since we're staying on a Halloween occult theme. Um, all of these actors and actresses had extremely close bonds with the Laurel Ca uh, Canyon community of musicians, and many of them also lived in Laurel Canyon. John Phillips' wife, Michelle, had relations, <laughs> relations with Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, Warren Beatty, Roman Polanski, and Gene Clark of The Birds. And from this relationship with actors and the musicians of Laurel Canyon uh, came all all sorts of sort of psychedelic movies. In 1967, uh, The Trip, which was about an LSD trip, was written by Jack Nicholson. It starred Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, and uh, Bruce Dern. It was directed by Roger Corman, who worked for years with David Crosby's dad in 23 different movies. Um, the music was by Graham Parsons, the International Submarine Band. And it was shot at the home of Arthur Love, of Love's Arthur Lee in Laurel Canyon. In 1968, they made a movie called Head with the Monkeys, uh, scripted by Jack Nicholson with Hopper Nicholson and Frank Zappa. The music was by the Monkeys, Carol King and Harry Nielsen. In 1968, they met, made Psych Out, which I wrote above it bad it was not a good movie with bruce dern and jack nicholson the monkeys were not considered a real band uh they were considered studio musicians which is rich because apparently um was it buffalo springfield or the birds the birds i guess really weren't musicians either they lived in laurel canyon mickey dolenz peter tork had homes and hung out there all the bands knew that studio musicians did most if not all of the monkeys music without getting any kind of credit at all the others uh the monkeys was a manufactured group it wasn't like friends got together and played and decided let's call ourselves a band somebody decided somebody non-musician non-singer a producer type person decided okay we don't know who we're going to make a band and so they started just auditioning people till they cobbled together a band so all of these people uh stephen sills david crosby i'm just going to throw names out but all the people that i've been mentioning uh, at one point or another in the process auditioned to be in the monkeys and got rejected for whatever reason so all these others had auditioned for the monkeys stephen sills Brian McLean of Love, Three Dog Nights, Danny Hutton. They were all rejected, plus others. Uh, on July 14th of 69, they released the movie Easy Rider. It was the most critically acclaimed of, acclaimed of all these movies. It was directed by Dan Dennis Hopper. It was written by Hopper and Fonda. It starred Fonda, Hopper, and Nicholson. Hopper's character was based on David Crosby. Uh, the Captain America character that Fonda played was inspired by um, John Phillips. John Phillips was into motorcycles and he was the motorcycle riding partner of Graham Parsons or um, Roger McGuinn of the Birds. Uh, McGuinn did the soundtrack and he joined with Stephen Wolf and the Fraternity of Man and Hendrix, all Laurel Canyon musicians. St incestuous. The art director, Jeremy Kay, had done Angels from Hell, Hell's Angels, Angels on Wheels, and Scorpio Rising with Kenneth Anger, which was an occult homage to gay biker culture. In the mid-70s, Anger made Satan's children. He belonged to the Solar Lodge of the Ordo Templi Orientis, the OTO. 
Two weeks after the premiere of Easy Rider, the cops got a phone tip to the Solar Lodge compound in Blythe, California, where they found a six-year-old boy in a six-by-six -six wooden crate in desert heat. His father was an L.A. County probation officer, and the child was chained to a steel plate in 170-degree heat and had been there for two months in the box. The box was, uh, had a can in it partially filled with human waste and flies. The child had been burned and beaten by cult members. The leader, Georgina Brayton, had uh, worse torture planned, and even if it was killing, that was okay with the mother. She was interviewed. 11 adults were charged with felony child abuse. Almost all of them were young white men in their early 20s. They were convicted. They had ties to Manson, and the group also had a home near the USC campus. They preached an apocalyptic race war, sound familiar? And two weeks later, after this event, the Tate murders happened. Manson's Barker Ranch was raided two, mo two months after that, October 12th of 69, which happens to be the birthday of Aleister Crowley and the head of the OTO, the uh, Orientis Templo Ardoni, until uh, the 1947 death of Crowley. The Young Turks were inexplicably tied with bands and inexplicably tied to Manson and very strange. For example, Bruce Dern, um, his godparents were, get this, Eleanor Roosevelt and Adlai Stevenson. No kidding. His paternal grandfather was George Dern, the Secretary of War, which is like the Secretary of Defense under FDR. He was also the governor of Utah and the chairman of the National Governors Association. Bruce's mother was Jean McLeish, the sister of Archibald McLeish, America's uh, Minister of War Propaganda. She and the assistant of Secretary of State and the Librarian of Congress, and a member of Skull and Bones in 1915, and just FYI, 1916, member of Skull and Bones was Prescott Bush, George Bush's grandfather. Peter Fonda, uh, the son of Henry Fonda, a U.S. Naval Intelligence officer who was married to Francis Ford Seymour, a claimed descendant, she claimed descent from Jane Seymour, the third wife of Henry VIII. She killed herself on uh, April 14th, 1950 by slitting her own throat and using a straight razor. Peter was 10. She had been the widow of George Brokaw, who had been previously a CIA operative and uh, been married to Claire Booth Luce. Eight months after her death, Henry Fonda remarried Susan Blanchard. In 1957, he married again Countess Af Afdera Franchetti, who later had an affair with JFK. She was the daughter of Baron Raimondo Franchetti, the consulate to Mussolini, and the great-granddaughter of Louise Sarah Rothschild. Hanks Henry Fonda. Hank's number one wife was Margaret Sullivan, a child of uh, military intelligence, and she also committed suicide in 1960. Nine months later, their daughter Bridget also killed herself. In 61, her sister Brooke Hayward married Dennis Hopper. I mean, it's so incestuous, you can't even keep track. In 1969, Hopper divorced Hayward, married Michelle Phillips on Halloween 1970. And I'm sorry, he, he married her in, he divorced in 1969, married in 1970. She filed for divorce eight days later, claiming that he had kept her handcuffed and imprisoned for a week, making unnatural sexual demands. Hopper claimed that he didn't handcuff her. This is terrible. I just punched her out. That was his excuse. And he was walking around free. Hopper's dad was an intelligence officer in the OSS during World War II in China, Burma, and India. One of the 100 guys who liberated General Rainwright from a Korean prison. Really, the Red Army liberated them and the 100 guys in uh, the army just accompanied him home. Uh, his father became a lay Methodist minister and always carried a gun. The family located, relocated to San Diego and 
apparently I thought this was important. Home of the Imperial Beach Naval Air Station, the United States Naval Radio Station, the United States Naval Amphibious Base, the North Island Naval Air Station, Fort Rosecrans Military Reservation, the United States Naval Training Center, the United States Marine Corps Recruit Depot, and the Miramar Marine Corps Air Station. And just north of the city sits the massive Camp Nem Pendleton Marine Corps Base. Other than that, though, San Diego, it's just a sleepy little bleep beach town where Dennis Hopper's dad ostensibly worked for the post office. <laughs> he makes so many inferences in this book, it is pretty funny. Hopper later became a proponent of right-wing causes and boasted ha of having voted for Republicans for 30 years. He died, um, that's Dennis Hopper, he died on May 29th, 2010. So, out of our three young Turk actors, one was the nephew of a member of Skull and Bones, one was the son of naval intelligence who uh, was married to a Rothschild, and one was the son of an OSS officer. Sharon Tate was the daughter of a career U.S. Army intelligence officer. Nancy Sinatra was the daughter of Frank Sinatra, a mafia associate. Frank also was the client of Jay Sebring. Henry Fonda was a client of Jay Sebring. Fonda once lived in the guest house at Cielo Drive, the Tate murder house. Warren Beatty was born in 1937. He was a client of Sebring. In fact, that movie, was it Hairdresser? Not Hairspray, that's a musical. You know, the one that he was in, Warren Beatty was in, and he was a hairdresser. They, it's supposed to be about Jay Sebring. In high school, his dad was Ira Owen Beatty, known as Mad Dog Beatty. He was a psychologist associated with the naval facilities in Richmond and Norfolk, Virginia. Jack Nicholson was born to a single mom, an underage showgirl. Nobody knows who his father was, and to avoid the stigma his grandparents claimed he was their son, he took their name and thought his mother was his older sister. He didn't learn that she was his mother until 1974 when he was 37 and she had been dead for 10 years. He has no birth certificate. He has a certificate of delayed reporting of birth was filed in 1954. He claims his uh, grandparents were his parents, and it, the, the birth certificate claims it, and says that he was born in New Jersey. An interesting aside, that's Jack Nicholson's story. It is identical to, um, what's his name, Ted Bundy. For two months, uh, I'm sorry, two more Turks, the son of possible uh, psychiatric, psychological spy for the Navy, and uh, two more, these two guys, were the sons of a possible psychological spy for the Navy and a guy who has no origins. He's a, an enigma. Henry Fonda got his first acting job through Dorothy Brando, the mother of Marlon Brando, who was later the next-door neighbor of Nicholson and the mother of Brando. She was a good friend of Henry Fonda's mother, Marlon Bandro uh, was a direct descendant of, this is hilarious, Louis Dubois and Catherine Blanchon Dubois. Remember that, Blanche? Uh, they were colonists in 1660, and uh, there's a whole big long list of his other direct descendants. Henry Fonda's family, well, this is interesting, these people have such weird connections, all of them. Henry Fonda is a direct descendant of Jealous Dow Fonda and Hester Johns Fonda, Dutch colonists who arrived in New York in 1650 and settled near what would become Albany. The Fondas had sailed out of Friesland, Netherlands on a ship dubbed the Valkenier, which happened to be co-owned by a very wealthy Dutchman by the name of Jean-Baptiste Van Rensselaer. And Mr. Van Rensselaer, as those who have been paying attention in class will recall, happened to be from the bloodline that would one day produce a guy by the name of David Van Cortland Crosby. Weird. Uh, so, to summarize, in Laurel Canyon, by the mid to late 60s, there were a large group of musicians that showed up simultaneously. Most were successful, and all, almost all were the kids of military or military intelligence communities. They mingled with actors who were the kids of military intelligence, and there was a large military intelligence facility in the center of Laurel Canyon where they all lived. So let's move on. Chapter nine, weird scenes inside the canyon and, oh, here's a good quote. 
got to do the quotes. There were a lot of weird people around. There was one guy who had a parrot called Captain Blood, and he was always scrawling real cryptic things on the inside walls of my house. Neil Young's too. This is Joni Mitchell describing the Laurel Canyon scene towards the end of 1960s. Um, Edmund G. Jerry Brown Jr. was a conservative fam uh, Republican family that st he studied to be a Jesuit, to, like to become a priest. He had a dad who became California governor after he changed his party from Republican to Democrat. And he was governor from 59 to 67. And from 67 to 1975, Reagan was governor. He changed his party from Democrat to Republican. After Reagan, Jerry Brown Jr. became governor. In the media, he is characterized as being an ultra-liberal extremist. He lived on Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon during the Laurel Canyon glory days. He was close friends with many, if not most, of these people that we've talked about, including the Eagles, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt. He was very close friends with Linda Ronstadt. Mike Kerb was a musician and record executive and a filmmaker. He was the music director of Mondo Hollywood from 65 to 67. Robert Cohen, in 54, was a U.S. Army Signal Corps uh, and in 55 was on special assignment for NATO and in special services in Germany. He made the documentary Inside Red China. He made the documentary Inside East Germany and Inside the Three Cubans. He claimed that he was the first Westerner allowed under uh, U.S. State Department uh, permission to go in there. The LA Times um, did a cri critique of Mondo and apparently it wasn't too good because I thought I'd read it. In a lengthy critique of Cohen's counterculture film, he offered up, they offered up some curious long forgotten facts about this documentary. I cannot presume to guess how much real life pokes through Mondo Hollywood. In violent, sudden ways, real death did intrude during the 18 months of picture making. Three people were killed in automobile crashes. One of them was Jane Mansfield, whose brief appearance as a celebrity remains in the final movie. The other two included a bona fide philosopher. They were scheduled to appear but died before filming. A writer who was to play himself died of drugs. A three-year-old child died of a fall. Uh, through a trap door, although he and his parents are still in the picture. A pilot who had agreed, and it wasn't a trap door, a pilot who had agreed to fly in the film died of a mid-air crash. In all, six people, none old, none of them in bed, died before Mondo Hollywood was released. Several buildings were also destroyed, and the Goodyear blimp, which provided the platform for some spectacular aerials in the finished movie, crashed one day after filming it, that scene. Okay, where are we here? The song producer, uh, Cohen, was a song producer for the riot on the Sunset Strip, the movie, and a lot of biker movies along with Fonda and Hopper. In 79, um, in Sacramento, Curb, I'm, we're talking about Curb, sorry. Curb was urged by Reagan to run, and he was elected as Governor Brown's second in command. So Jerry Brown was the governor, and this guy Curb, who had done all these weird, bizarro movies, was now lieutenant governor. Brown spent most of his time outside California running for president, and Curb ran the state. And he enacted many reactionary right-wing laws that shocked the people who had elected Brown. In the 50s and the 60s, the men who served as the architects of George, Washington, George W. Bush's foreign policy met regularly in Laurel Canyon in the house of Alex Abella. He was in the Rand Corporation, a think tank founded by the Air Force to get ideas that, uh, how, about how the Air Force might win uh, a nuclear war with Russia. The dominant figure in the Rand Corporation was Albert Wallstetter, a nuclear strategist. He heavily, heavily influenced the uh, Bush administration and the acolytes thereof. Most of these acolytes need little introduction. Uh, Richard Pearl, former Assistant Secretary of Defense, 
former U.S. Ambassador, President of the World Bank, and Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the U.N., Zalmay Khalilzad, and Andrew Marshall, who was served as the Director of the United States Department of Defense's Office of Net Assessment for 40 years and who served as a mentor to Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz, all these guys associated with the Rand Corporation, whose only job was to come up with ways to wage nuclear war. War. Also in Laurel Canyon in the 60s and the 70s were, uh, was the most infamous male madam, Billy Briars, a wealthy son of an oil magnate and a gay porn producer. He had a brothel at the summit of Laurel Canyon. It was rumored that J. Edgar Hoover was his best client and was called Mother John. Briars was in tr uh, trouble for child pornography in 1973 and the cops got confessions out of the people that hustled for him. And so apparently they were running a child pornography um, industry there as well as all this other stuff that was going on. Early in the 60s, Ron Patterson and his wife hosted a kids theater uh, workshops in their Laurel Canyon home. Later, he started the Renaissance Fair. I went to that. It was fun, which was the med medieval precursor to Burning Man. <laughs> he died January uh, 2011 at the age of 80. A weird connection there that they're making between Laurel Canyon and once again, children's groups child pornography. Paul Rothschild in 1959 was in the intelligence, the Army Intelligence Corps. He produced The Doors, Love, and Joplin. Uh, then there's this guy, Augustus Owsley Stanley. That's really his name. He was the premier LSD chemist. He flooded San Francisco and Laurel Canyon with the highest quality cheap LSD. He gave away tons. Uh, he said that his intentions were priestly and magical. He was the son of a military officer who after World War II worked in Washington, D.C. He was raised in Arlington, Virginia. His grandfather was in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1903 to 1915. He was the governor of Kentucky from 15 to 19 and a senator, U.S. Senator from 19 to 1925. Um, that would have made him his great grandfather. The senator's father, the great-grandfather, was a minister of the Disciples of Christ and a judge advocate for the Confederate Army. Uh, let's see. Augustus attended military school and was kicked out in the ninth grade uh, for being drunk. At 15, he spent 15 months in government hospitals for the insane. Then his mother died. He dropped out totally at 18, and he somehow managed, despite his lack of high school, to get into the University of Virginia. He enlisted in the Air Force in 1956 as a 21-year-old and became an intelligence and radar officer. After the Air Force, he went to L.A. to do ballet. <laughs> he also worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And that was a hotbed of uh, weird occult stuff going on there with that, that, that guy who started Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons. Uh, they were something else. Then he moved to Berkeley and he stole the recipe for LSD from the Berkeley Library and made meth and LSD in his bathroom near campus. February 21st of 65, he was raided by the state and he got off with no charges and all of his laboratory equipment was returned to him immediately. He produced questions we don't know why. He produced 4 million pure LSD tablets and took uh, pals like the Grateful Dead, they all got together and they went to Watts to do an acid test. They rented a house next door to a brothel and gave acid to everybody. They left right before the uh, riots broke out in April of 65. Owsley's financial backer, um, no, Owsley was the financial backer of the dead. He created electronic changes to how rock music sounded to the masses and they were brainwave changes intentionally. In 67, STP was a hallucinogen that was created in Zappa's birthplace, the Edgewood Arsenal, 
and uh, it was created as a biowarfare agent. It began being passed out. It was distributed by Owsley as a recreational drug. He got the recipe from Alexander Shugan, a Harvard ex-Navy research chemist for Dow, who worked with the DEA making links between the government and the military and these drugs that freaked everybody out. Owsley served at, he served time in Terminal Island in the prison. He moved to Australia and in March of 2012 he died in a car wreck. Chapter 10, Helter Skelter in a Summer Swelter, The Return of the Death List. So this is the Laurel Canyon Death List continued. Brian Jones, who was closely tied to Laurel Canyon, uh, at the age of 27, drowned July 3rd, 1969. Three days later, the Stones played in Hyde Park and footage appears in a Kenneth Anger film, um, Invocation of My Demon Brother. Jones had founded the Stones and he was the main creative force and he was unceremoniously dumped on June 9th and replaced four days later by uh, Mick Taylor, who was then replaced by Ron Wood. Rumors were that Jones was booted for his chronic substance abuse. So uh, what was Keith Richards' excuse? In 68, the band was flirting with Satanism and the occult and spending a lot of time in Laurel Canyon with their pals. During this time, Jagger was in two occult Crowley-influenced films Anger's Lucifer Rising and Cornell's Performance. The film dragged on and on and Jagger had to go. He was replaced by Jimmy Page. Page owned the world's largest Crowley connection, including Boliskine, which is Boliskine Estate, which was Alex Crowley's estate, on Loch Ness. When it was released, the soundtrack was 100% done by Bobby Beausoleil from uh, prison. <laughs> he was in prison when he recorded all of it. And uh, the writer was uh, co-director of performance, Don Camel, who was a very close friend of Roman Polanski. He was the son of Charles Richard Camel, a close friend and biographer of Crowley. Uh, he was Crowley's godson. Marilyn Brando was uh, to star in it, but didn't. He wrote the book with Camel, however, that the movie was based on. Brando, May 16, 1990. His son Christian shot Dag Drolet, the father of his sister Cheyenne's unborn child near Laurel Canyon. Christian was convicted, but received a very light sentence. Brando had Cheyenne locked up in a mental institution in Tahiti to avoid legal subpoenas. In April 14th of 1995, she was found hanged. In 96, Christian was released from prison and he got involved with, of all people, Bonnie Lee Bakley, uh, who died May 4th, 2001, when she was possibly shot by her husband, number 10, Robert Blake. July 1st, 2004, Brando dropped dead. His home was bought by Jack Nicholson. And in 2008, his son Christian dropped dead at the age of 49. Performance by Camel uh, had Jagger as a debauched rock star and James Fox as a violent mafioso sent to London to embed with, oh, he was sent to London to embed with gangsters so that he would know what it meant to be a mafioso. He came back completely changed and from, ever, from then on acted as if he were really a gangster. At the end of the film, he had a complete breakdown and he withdrew from acting and the public life. The soundtrack was by Bernard Nietzsche. It started out with Sonny Bono working for Phil Spector and uh, it ended up um, that they, they, Sonny Bono helped create the wall of sound with Phil Spector. They hired Lowell George for, uh, the, to do the performance soundtrack and Laurel George uh, was shot in the head in April of 1996. Possible suicide never, never determined. And Nietzsche, the guy who was doing performance with Camel, died of a heart attack in the year 2000. So it's just this endless litany of tragedies. It's horrible. Steve Brandt was a gossip columnist and a close friend of Sharon Tate and John Phillips. 
he was one of the Tate victims because he was so destroyed by it that he died of an overdose in November of 69. In the days and the months after the Tate murder, he made many calls to the LAPD in which he was frantic and said he was fearful for his life, but they didn't pursue it and he went to New York um, and tried to get on stage during a performance of the Rolling Stones, tried to get grab the microphone, uh, like he wanted to make an announcement. He couldn't get the LAPD to listen to him and he went to try to get somebody to listen to him and it was desperate and of course he was unceremoniously escorted off the stage, went home, took pills and died. David Blue was born Stuart David Cohen in 1941. His dad went to war and came back raging, and he describes it as a raging, hellish childhood. He joined the Navy at 18 and was kicked out. He was a folk singer. His first album was in 1966. His second album was produced by Graham Nash. He was one of the first who signed with uh, David Geffen's uh, asylum label, like Judy Sill. And also, like Judy Sill, sort of went into security, uh, obscurity. He never made it big. Um, December 2nd, 1982, he dropped dead while jogging in New York's Washington Square Park. His body was three days in the morgue before anybody noticed he wasn't around and he was identified. Ricky Nelson, everybody remembers Nicky Nelson, son of Ozzy and Harriet, 57 rock and roll star. In 62, he had 30 top 40 hits. Uh, he was number three on the top 40 behind Elvis Presley and Pat Boone. In 1950, I saw Pat Boone. <laughs> I was in the Girl Scouts in 1964. My Girl Scout troop went to Universal Studios, you know, for the tour. It was terrible. Um, and Pat Boone was in the parking lot and everybody went, oh, Pat Boone. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> and he sat on the um, hood of his car and played his guitar and sang for us. And what I remember was he had white shoes. <laughs> Anyway, in 1956, Elvis went to Hollywood, and he had two very close friends, Dennis Hopper and Nick Adams. Uh, John Phillips, Mike Nesmith, and Graham Parsons um, hired Elvis's band to play as backup for their music. Emmy Lou Harris was the daughter of a U.S. Marine Corps officer who grew up outside Washington, D.C., in Virginia, near the Harry Diamond Laboratories and the Woodbridge Research Facility for Army Research and Development. She, they were experimenting with mind control. Jack Anderson, the columnist, uh, was the one who um, broke that story. Ricky Nelson shed his teen idol image uh, and pioneered country rock with the Stone Canyon Band. He had moved to Stone Canyon from Laurel Canyon. He was killed December 31st in 85 in a plane crash. The cabin filled with smoke and forced a crash landing and every passenger died but the crew survived. Nelson was living in Errol Flynn's old house that had spy holes and tunnels and it was reported that these spy holes weren't just a spy for lascivious lascivious reasons that uh, Errol Flynn was actually a, a spy and had guests that were important people and spied on them. After Nelson died, um, the house remained empty until a gang broke into it and murdered a girl in there. And then there was a mysterious fire and half the house burned and it was eventually torn down. This, we're still doing the litany of dead people from Laurel Canyon. John Denver. He was born December 31st, 1943. Henry Jean, Henry John Duchendorf <laughs> Jr. Born in Roswell, <laughs> New Mexico. His dad was a U.S. Air Force officer at Roswell Airfield, which became Walker Air Force Base. Remember that? He uh, went to Texas Tech and in 64 moved to LA and was in the Chad Mitchell Trio. He uh, took part in, uh, he took the part of Jim McGuinn who joined the Birds and Jim McGuinn is Roger McGuinn, we'll talk about that. November 66, uh, Denver was uh, in the front of the riot, engaging in the riot. 
on Sunset Strip with Peter Fonda, Sal Mineo, and Sonny and Cher. Late in the 70s, he got into Werner Earhart's e Est, and he wrote the theme song for Est. He testified with Frank Zappa at the Parents Music Resource Center hearings in 1985 against Tipper Gore and labeling music, censoring music. In October, October 12th of 1997, his experimental plane crashed and he was killed. So I'm going to stop here and uh, we will continue in a minute. I hope you're enjoying this. What, uh, a couple of people are upset <laughs> that this is just a crazy series of theories and, uh, you know, I said that at the beginning. It's it's just a way of collecting this information and looking at it from a different point of view. Connections can be made. The human brain loves patterns. It's all fact. Uh, it can be interpreted in different ways. And I just think it's an entertaining way to look at it and appropriate for the Halloween season since so much weird stuff happens in this book around Halloween. And I hope you're enjoying it as much as I did when I first read it. And uh, thank you, and I'll be back soon. Sláinte. <laughs>